afternoon. Uh, I want to begin today by uh, giving a brief COVID-19 update. Uh, this morning we held another meeting of our COVID-19 response team. Uh, I said last week uh, that Maryland has begun to see an uptick in our key health metrics and we're uh, increasingly concerned by the sharp rise in hospitalizations which have doubled over the last three weeks. Health officials are also warning uh, that the convergence of the flu and the Delta and Omicron variants uh, could lead to further spiking metrics and hospitalizations. Uh, based on all the preliminary data, Omicron is believed to be potentially four times more transmissible uh, than previous strains of COVID-19, and it is anticipated to rapidly overtake Delta as the main driver of new cases over the next 12 weeks. Omicron has already been detected here in the state of Maryland, as well as in 18 other states and 50 other countries. Uh, initial studies do indicate that higher levels of immunity from booster shots uh, does provide protection against the Omicron variant, uh, which makes it more important than ever uh, that every single Marylander who is eligible for a booster shot uh, should get a booster shot as soon as possible. I want to thank all the Marylanders who have already gotten their boosters in record numbers. As of today, uh, the state of Maryland has administered 1.3 million booster shots, and all Marylanders 18 and older are eligible for a booster. Especially as we approach the holiday season, I want to again stress that getting a booster truly is the single most important thing you can do to protect yourself, uh, your family, and your fellow Marylanders. We've also been working closely with our hospital partners to make sure providers are aggressively offering monoclonal antibody therapy. Uh, state health officials strongly recommend the use of monoclonal antibodies for COVID positive individuals. It's one of the first things that you should consider doing uh, before having to go to the hospital when by then it may already be too late. We will be introducing emergency legislation uh, to give our hospital systems some tools to address staffing shortages. Uh, during the state of emergency and throughout the pandemic, we took proactive steps to assist hospitals in increasing their nursing workforce, including providing flexibility to allow registered nurses uh, and licensed practical nurses who hold a current active license in any other state or jurisdiction to be able to render nursing care in the state of Maryland. Uh, state health officials have strongly encouraged hospital si systems to utilize nursing students, nursing assistants, and physicians' assistants as force multipliers. Uh, we have requested all state nursing programs to expedite uh, classes and to allow for the earliest possible graduation for qualified nursing students. The emergency legislation we submit uh, will allow all of these important emergency actions to be made permanent. The Health Department will be taking some additional immediate actions in the days ahead as we continue to use every uh, tool at our disposal to help Maryland hospitals uh, to get the resources they need to respond to this and to future hospital surges. Now I want to move on to the uh, special or perhaps not so special session of the legislature. Before Thanksgiving, following a string of particularly heinous and disturbing violent crimes in the streets of Baltimore, we submitted emergency legislation for tougher sentencing for violent criminals, specifically those who continue to commit violent felonies with guns uh, and legislation that brings greater transparency to the sentences handed down by judges uh, for violent crimes. We have repeatedly proposed this legislation, but year after year, the legislature has refused to take action. Meanwhile, while we wait for them to act, thousands of people have been killed in the city of Baltimore. Uh, as an example, the suspect who was recently arrested for the murder of 69-year-old Evelyn Player at her church had been previously arrested over and over and over again for other violent crimes against women. And he was repeatedly let, let back out onto the streets. Yet day after day, year after year, as violent crime escalates, 
and the death toll rises, the General Assembly continues to fail to pass critical anti-violent crime measures. Now, these emergency bills are strongly supported by an overwhelming majority of Baltimore City residents and all Marylanders. Uh, yet, legislators continue to ignore the desperate pleas of their constituents. This week, despite the fact that Baltimore surpassed the staggering milestone of 300 murders for the seventh straight year, legislators claimed that they just didn't have time to even consider this critically needed emergency legislation. Um, they are ignoring the out of control violent crime, the shootings and murders that are destroying Baltimore City, and they're ignoring the desperate pleas of more than 80% of the people of Baltimore and the rest of the state who support this legislation. The same politicians who have repeatedly ignored and rejected these proposals to fight violent crime continue to offer no alternatives or solutions of their own. Instead, in the past few days, they actually uh, voted instead to make it even easier for violent criminals to get out of jail rather than imposing uh, consequences and taking the shooters off the street. Yesterday, despite the efforts of Senate Republicans, not one single Democrat was willing to vote with them, join with them to even bring these bills to the floor for an up or down vote. Now, this isn't just politics as usual. This is disgraceful and dangerous. It isn't a matter of Republicans versus Democrats. It's a matter of life and death. And it's not just about the differences between uh, the right and the left. It's a difference between right and wrong. And there is still time for the legislature to reverse course and follow the will of nearly all of their constituents by taking immediate action on this emergency legislation. Today, I am once again calling on city leaders and the city delegation to stop working against this legislation and calling on legislative leaders across the state to finally take action on violent crime. The citizens will not be able to take back their streets and their communities without city leaders and legislators doing the jobs that they were elected to do. Now, rather than passing these emergency crime bills and protecting our citizens, the focus of uh, the legislature this week has instead been on protecting themselves uh, by making it uh, the worst, most gerrymandered districts, by making even the worst and most gerrymandered districts in America even worse. Uh, being worst in America is not the distinction we want for the great state of Maryland. The actions of these politicians in Annapolis this week are a perfect example of everything that's wrong with our broken political system. It's an unmitigated arrogance of power, and Marylanders are completely fed up. Last month, I accepted and submitted uh, the fair legislative and congressional maps, which were created by the Maryland Citizens Redistricting Commission. The commission was comprised of citizens free from any kind of legislative or political influence who are representative of the state's diversity and demographics. The commission held 36 open public meetings in which thousands of members of the public participated. Their focus was on fairness, transparency, and accountability. And the results was a set of maps that received a grade of A for fairness by the Princeton Gerrymandering Project. Uh, but it's been made crystal clear this week that the legislature uh, has rigged the process and predetermined the result from the outset to ignore the commission's maps. These politicians drew their own districts in secret behind closed doors. These terrible maps drawn by the legislature have been universally panned and have received a flunking F grade by the Princeton Project. Even Democratic Congressman Kwaisi Mfume, a former president of the NAACP, called Democrats' attempts to seize control of the state's congressional representation overreach and a bridge too far. And the congressman said that if 
It's been Baltimore that's been chopped at and bitten at in 1990 and 2000 and 2010, and here we go now again in 2020. These gerrymandered maps will be challenged in both the federal and state courts. These maps disenfranchise voters, they violate uh, the Voting Rights Act, and they are in violation of numerous state and federal laws. On Monday, Attorney General Merrick Garland announced that the Department of Justice is suing the state of Texas in order to block its new gerrymandered congressional map. The map passed by the legislature here in Maryland is far, uh, a far more egregious civil rights violation than the Texas map. And so today we're calling on the Biden administration to immediately add the state of Maryland into that lawsuit. Uh, for many years, I've been a leading uh, advocate at the state and national level, pushing for real nonpartisan redistricting reform uh, to allow citizens to actually pick their representatives rather than politicians picking their voters. Um, we're here in the nation's oldest state house that served as the first capital of the United States, where we ratified the Treaty of Paris ending the Revolutionary War. American democracy literally began right here in this very place. And yet, when it comes to free and fair elections, Maryland is failing to live up to that proud legacy. This congressional map, drawn in back rooms by party bosses in Annapolis, makes a mockery of our democracy, and it's an embarrassment to all that our state stands for. And if you think these congressional maps are bad, just wait until you see what they plan to do with the legislative maps, which as we speak, they're conspiring on in secret behind closed doors. So on behalf of all the people of Maryland who value fairness and integrity in our elections and in our political system, I am vetoing these disgracefully gerrymandered illegal maps, which are a shameful violation of state and federal law. This is not the end of the process. This is just the beginning. The courts will be the final arbiter, not the partisan legislature. These maps cannot and will not stand. With that, I'd be happy to take a few questions. I think the lawmakers are perfectly uh, uh, fully aware of what my, my position has been for the past seven years. There was no reason to speak to them. Anybody else? I mean, I'm, I'm always an eternal optimist. I'm not sure that I really believe that they will, but they can. They're, they're going to be here another day. I, I believe they're going to try to probably vote to override this veto, uh, which you know, I wanted to take the action right away rather than waiting uh, another week uh, because we want to be able to let the uh, court process begin right away uh, to overturn them, their action. Uh, but they're going to be here in session. Uh, they could very easily pass the crime bills just as quickly as they pass these terrible maps. And I'm still hopeful, but uh, I, you know, I just placed the first bet at MGM that in Maryland for sports betting. I'm, if I was betting, I probably wouldn't put all the money on that. Are you surprised that they didn't take it up? I'm very disappointed, uh, although not surprised. Uh, you know, the Senate passed our bills a couple, couple of times. House has never acted on them, and uh, so it's frustrating. We will be bringing them back in the legislative session, and I can assure you, we'll be fighting for 90 days to make sure that they get them done if they don't get them done tomorrow. 
I think there's going to be different uh, federal and state uh, actions, but they'll be they'll be taken they'll be uh, in, taken by aggrieved citizens whose rights have been violated. I would say they're absolutely wrong. I mean, uh, I don't know if we can show that map up on the wall, but they're they're really probably the most egregious. Uh, representation of a violation of the voting rights. If you see what they did to Prince George's County and two districts that were created by the Voting Rights Act um, to create majority minority districts and Prince George's County's you know, the fourth congressional district carves out, winds all the way around through multiple counties and Edgewater and Davidsonville. Uh, you look at the district, you know, instead of having a, a Baltimore City congressional district, which is what was originally intended and what Kwaisi and Fume has been so articulate on, uh, they take Baltimore City and spread it all around multiple districts. There's anybody that looks at the map. It takes, you know, you don't have to be a lawyer to figure out that these are not fair maps. And uh, they, they had to go to great, uh, they had to go, they're like contortionists the way they had to create these tortured maps. Governor, you mentioned, uh, I talked with Majority Leader King yesterday. He said that these maps were done by uh, lawyers and, and they do it before the court. Do, do you think, what do you think the process is? Well, we're going to see what the courts decide. Uh, you know, they, they, these maps were created by the same person that did the gerrymandering last time, where Martin O'Malley uh, admitted uh, under oath uh, in a federal court that he did break the law. But uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court chose not to take action, and they kicked it back to the states. And this is the next step in the process. Well, look, the, the way the process works uh, is the governor submits a set of maps to the legislature, and the legislature then takes action and votes or amends those maps. Uh, I happen to be the first Republican in the history of the state to be involved uh, because every single 10-year you know, cycle since 1790 when they did the first census has been a Democratic governor and a Democratic legislature. So it's an unusual process where they weren't just getting together behind closed doors to do it together. Um, I could have drawn maps and tried to do the same thing and been unfair and gerrymandered and drawn, drawn districts that would, that would enable Republicans, but I didn't because I'm very much opposed to that. So we allowed citizens to just draw fair maps that don't favor anybody, uh, that are drawn the way they're supposed to be drawn. And uh, for them to uh, just ignore, basically dismiss uh, in an arrogant way the, the, the people that spent months and months and held 36 hearings and thousands of people that participated and say, we don't care what you want. We don't care what the people want. And in most Democrats and Republicans, it doesn't matter what party you are, people don't like this unfair process. Um, and uh, so I, I, I think, uh, you know, we'll, the, the process is starting now. Uh, my guess is that they'll take some action tomorrow to, to uh, overturn my veto. And then uh, it will be many months before we get to the bottom of exactly what's going to happen in the next election. Yes. Well, it's a, it's an ongoing um, you know investigation. I'll just say that uh, you know it, it was a you know cyber attack that we were hit. We were luckily we have been taking some pretty serious actions uh, over the past several years and over the past many months, uh, and we're in a much better position than we ha we would have been. Uh, you know, I pushed to make sure that uh, cyber was added into the infrastructure bill. It wasn't in the Republican bill or the Biden bill, and we got that taken care of. We've been taking actions at the state, holding cyber summits. and But it, this is the wave of the future. People are going to be vulnerable, and whether they're uh, state agencies or private sector companies or federal government. Everybody's going to be, this cyber is the number one threat we face in America. Uh, th this was a, you know, we, our system was compromised, but at this point it appears to be much, much uh, less intrusive and uh, with a much better outcome than we were afraid might be the case. Um, we don't believe that, um, that any data was sacrificed, and uh, I think they're digging into it and getting to the problem of it. They made a lot of progress already, and uh, we're hopeful it's going to be a good uh, result. Has it toppled in any way the, the state's ability to track cases in real time? 
No, it has, uh, it slowed down some of the posting of things on websites. We, we're trying to, we're all about transparency and updating things. We have all the data still, none of the data has been compromised. And uh, I think as of today or tomorrow, all of the, all of the postings on the, uh, on the websites will be back up to date. But it hasn't, it hasn't changed any of the data gathering or really put us in any kind of a tough position with respect to, uh, you know, the data in our system. Well, I've been pushing for that for more than 20 years. Uh, and look, uh, it, I think gerrymandering is a cancer on our democracy. There's no question that both parties are guilty of it, that it happens across the country. There, you know, Republicans do it just as much as Democrats. Uh, I think it should be resolved at the federal level. I think the Supreme Court should have resolved the issue, but they didn't. They kicked it all back to the states. Uh, and now we are the worst, most egregious case of gerrymandering in America. It happens to be Democrats that have been in control since 1790. Um, uh, that's not to say that the other side isn't guilty, but uh, just two, mu two wrongs don't make a right. And uh, you know, this is uh, not just the congressional maps, but the legislative maps, and we want to do the right thing here and lead by example. I don't like being the follower. We want to, you know, we can't say we're not going to do it until everybody else does it. It's just nonsense. But you don't support that legislation? I I've been supporting that type of legislation for a long time. I mean, it's, it's a little bit rich that this, this legislation is sponsored by uh, you know, uh, uh, Congressman Sarbanes, who, who is the worst, most gerrymandered district in America, and he's not willing to fix his own district. Governor, Governor, Governor uh, is Virginia uh, playing up in, uh, in the district and pulling out of the regional room, how's that? Initiative? Is it something you and your administration support? What's your reaction to that? Would you try to dissuade him from that? I, you know, I don't have a lot of detail about, I didn't hear what he said about it. I just picked up you know, in between meetings that, that uh, he had either said something or taken some action today. I know that we're, uh, we have a meeting uh, scheduled with uh, Governor-elect Yunkin at some point over the next couple of weeks. I think he's going to come visit us here in Annapolis and sit down together. And so we're hoping to have a chance to catch up with him and what his plans are for the Commonwealth of Virginia. I know we're planning to talk about building the American Legion Bridge and fixing traffic on the Beltway and working on Chesapeake Bay issues. And, you know, I'll probably, uh, you know, talk to him and find out more about what he's talking about with Reggie. But obviously we're supporting Reggie. We were encouraging other states to join Reggie. Uh, and we think, uh, you know, doing something about greenhouse gas emissions and clean air is pretty important. So, I, I, but I can't really speak for Governor-elect Youngkin. Thank you. Thank you guys.